boys and girls, friends, ladies and gentlemen around the world, purveyors of performance. It's episode three of Rambling About Cars. I'm co-host Christopher Smith. Across the screen is co-host Chris Bruce. I'm right here. I was off a little bit last week, Chris. How you doing, man? Let's catch up a little bit. I'm doing good. Yeah, you what? Tuesday to Tuesday through Friday, right? Oh well, I I worked Tuesday, but then I just took a you know like a three day kind of staycation. Okay, so okay. But uh, how was that? Do any fun drives? Anything cool? I, I did. Um, of course, I'm in Western South Dakota. One of the reasons that I wanted to take the time off, uh, we were having just fantastic weather. By that, I mean, it's not snowing and cold. Um, it was actually about 60 degrees on, on Wednesday. That's a lot nicer than it is here. Well, Ed, we've had really no winter this year. I mean, I'm almost to the Wyoming border. You get up in the Black Hills and yeah, there's some snow, but I, I mean, it's been nice. It's been warm. So we went out for a drive, just kind of toured around some of the prairie areas. Um, I indulged my back road desires uh, and found all kinds of gravel roads. I, I was probably like 30 miles just just, just rallying it down down gravel roads. It, uh, I, I, was your wife with you with like her uh, white knuckling it or was it just you alone? She was with me and she had a good time too. Um, okay, good. Good, good, good. The enthusiast kind of person that I am. Um, so I, I mean, I, I took it easy. I mean, we're out having a good time together. Right. And that's what really matters. So, um, but I mean, that said, I mean, I was still well above expected speeds for, uh, for dirt roads. So, um, we, so we, for the folks who don't quite know where you live, you're kind of, you're both near uh, Mount Rushmore and what is it? Devil's tower, devil's chimney yeah, Devil's tower, right? I, I'm in, I'm in rapid city, which is, okay. which is right at the, base of the Black Hills, kind of the central Black Hills. So yeah, Mount Rushmore is about 30 miles south. Uh, Devil's Tower is probably, it's, it's about a two hour drive. Oh, I thought it was um, closer, okay. Um, but I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm very close to the Wyoming border. I'm very close to the Montana border. Um, I'm kind of hesitant to say this because I don't want people to move out here, but one of the reasons I moved here is there are some of the best roads in the world that nobody knows about. Mm -hmm. I can go over to the prairie and if I just want straight, like, 20-mile visibility roads, I got them. I can go up into the hills just a few miles away and have some of the, the greatest switchbacks, hairpins, mountain driving, canyon carving, you can imagine. And the scenery is fantastic. Um, and, yeah, and, and we went out to enjoy a little bit of that on Wednesday. The idea was it's going to be warm all week. We'll have fun with that. But then a front came through. And we had like 60, 70, even some 80 mile an hour winds. Whoa, from, that's from, yeah. Who, who knew you get a hurricane in South Dakota, you know, that, that was so I mean, stayed in the rest of the time. And I mean, just with everything that's been going on in the world, gosh, the, I mean, the last couple of months, just a, just a few days to kind of catch your breath, get back to a, you know, get back to things, kind of recenter yourself. I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're writing four or five articles a day. Easily. Yeah. There's, there's a very, very constant pace to keep going. Yeah. And without any winter here, I was like, well, let's take a couple of days off. I know winter, <laughs> we, we have a, we have a writer, a uh, colleague of ours that's down in Austin, Texas, that I think has received more snow this year than I have. If you can believe that. <laughs> has he, you've got more than, he's got like two inches. Have you got less than that? I mean, I, I guess, no, I, I mean, I, I don't think I've had more than a foot of snow, 12 inches yeah, total here. This we year. haven't either. Um, I do have a, a relative that moved to Oklahoma and he, I know he's definitely had more snow than I've had. So it's been, been a weird year. But speaking of winter and speaking of snow, that segues perfectly into one of our topics this week. Yeah. And we were kind of thinking about that and we wanted to get on the topic of winter beaters. And for folks that maybe have never heard that term that are, you know, in the South or places that never get snow, um, you know, the roads get crappy. There's, there's ice, there's snow, obviously there's salt or cinders or whatever they put on the road. And so if you have a nicer car or just a car that you like, you might not want to put it through that. And so the idea of the winter beater is you buy a cheap crappy car and you drive it through the winter. And maybe if you're lucky, once spring comes and it warms up, you sell it for exactly what you bought it for. Maybe it you know, falls apart during the winter. It, that happens too. But um, it, it often happens. <laughs> but yeah. And Chris, you've had what? 
over 30 cars, many of them winter beaters. Is that right? My name is Christopher Smith, and I have a used car, cheap car addiction. It is true. Um, I mean, I, I spent most of my years in Michigan, specifically in southeast Michigan and then in southwest Michigan, in the you know right in the heart of some of the Lake Michigan snow belts. And when I started getting some nicer cars, I, I happened to work for a used car dealership at the time. And I was like, man, I don't really want to drive this through the winter. Let's just get something cheap. And this is back... This is back when you could still get a halfway decent car for under a thousand dollars. And when I say halfway decent, I mean, it's like halfway rusty instead of all the way rusty. Right. So that kind of started my chain. The first winter beater I had was a 1993 Dodge Spirit, um, a completely uninspiring car. It had the four cylinder, but I got it for 400 bucks. It needed some some engine work. Um, I, I had a friend help me out with that. I cleaned it up. I'm, I'm pretty good with body work, uh, detailing. So, I mean, make sure it was maintained, cleaned it up in the winter. I think I had like a thousand or 1100 bucks into it, sold it for 1700 in the spring. Yeah. So once you do that once and you sort of get hooked mm-hmm. and what I didn't expect to happen was I started to really have a passion for these just old beat up cars that after 10, 15, 20 years, they have their own endearing personalities. Mm -hmm. I, I I wouldn't see, you know, a a broken window switch has necessarily a fault. It's just, it's a unique characteristic of this car. And I mean, I've had, oh gosh, uh, I've had Volkswagen GTIs. Um, I've had, I've had more Taurus shows than I probably should admit. Um, let's see, Ford Contour in there. Oh gosh. Oh, I had a, I had a beautiful 91 Escort GT that was like horrendously rusty. (laughs) Um, but I mean, it's just the, the rear springs had like blocks on the springs from the previous owner, presumably because something was broken back there. So it basically had solid rear suspension. Mm -hmm. It was not a good riding car, but just, you know, for reasons I can't explain, I loved it. I had Subarus. Wagons, you know, legacy, sedans. Right? I had two legacies. Oh, two legacies. Okay. I, I had a wagon, and then I had a '91, if I remember correctly, the uh, the turbo, the sports sedan turbo. Oh wow! Yeah. Rare, That's rare, because because it had it had the good it had the good diff in it. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, it was the EJ22, uh, the the closed deck mm-hmm. engine. I, th- I think it's the EJ22, or maybe the EJ20. I I, I Whatever. can't remember. Yeah. It, it was it was the good engine, but. It was terrifically. I mean, it was. I should never have bought it. I broke my own rules because I fell in love with the car before I even looked at it, mm-hmm. and it was actually leaking gas while I was looking at it. That's like one of my rules. Okay, leaking gas, walk away. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, well, it's not leaking that much gas. So yeah, it was it, it was it was bad. But we, we're going to do a little challenge here today. We are. Um, yeah. So with that in mind, we kind of thought. So I initially came at you, I said $5,000 budget. And you came back at me and you were like, no, that that's too easy, $1,000. I'm like, <laughs> dude, so I am an inveterate Craigslist lurker. I look, I legit look at Craigslist every day um, and like have my own, like year sub 2000, I look at, Toledo, Akron, Canton, Cleveland, and Columbus every day because those are kind of in my I, – I could get to any of those places, and I'm always looking. And I know these days finding a $1,000 car is a challenge. I, From what I've heard, cash for clunkers, it really – decimated that market for the really, really cheap stuff. So with that in mind, I came back at you with, at two grand and we agreed on that. And we, we from, met, we met the what you told me in the pre-show, you might've cheated a little bit. No, but. no, 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 they, no. <laughs> I'm sure if I offered some money for these cars, I could get them for under 2000. Okay. Fair enough. Um, why don't so, you, why don't you, why don't you lead us off? Yeah, 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 absolutely. I will start things off here. So, so, so we, we each pick two cars. We each pick two cars and they were supposed to be $2,000 or under. Uh, you cheated, but anyway, <clears throat> I didn't cheat. Okay. <laughs> so my first car here, 
I'm going to start with the one that I'm tempted to actually buy for bad reasons. Let's so let's see it. This is a 1994 Saturn SL2 sedan. Oh, don't 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 do it. So, but look at let let me show you these pictures. Was it 18, 1800 bucks? Hmm, yeah, eighteen hundred dollars. Um, for our, uh, you know, it's got the plastic body panel, so it's going to look good on the outside because there's nothing to rust. But here's my thought. <laughs> look at so I hope you are watching the YouTube version. If not, I will tell you that this interior is as clean as any car as I've seen. It's cleaner than the car I own. It, is that the actual interior or is that a press photo from no, no, no. Before? So I can tell you because there's the other side and you can see the doors and everything. That is the actual interior. It's, it's definitely been detailed inside and out. I, I'll, right. I'll give them that. And unfortunately, this seller does not provide an underhood photo. So maybe it's an absolute mess. I well, and, and there you have it with the Saturn because, I mean, those body panels aren't going to rust, right? That's that's the plastic car basically on the outside what's it look like underneath right but it's, my thought it's early is, 90s gm what's it look like underneath if you put that much love into the interior i feel like it's got to be decent mechanically it can't be that bad and you know it, also as a winter car it's front wheel drive it's lightweight you it, you know if anything hits it you don't have to worry about it getting dented in this case it, you know, I, I will 7,000 miles for a 94, you know, that's, that's to be expected. There, there's no, I don't see any red flags. The price is right. It looks really nice. Yeah. Am I crazy I here? To, what do you think? No, no, you're not crazy. Um, I'm not a huge Saturn fan. That car's kind of cool. And I'm not um, either like it, but, but you're, you're hitting, you're hitting all the right spots with the idea of driving this for a few months and then reselling it. Um, it does look great inside and out. That will appeal to buyers. 157,000 miles. I mean, yeah, it's it's up there in miles, but it's, come on, it's what, a 26-year-old car? Right. You know, it's, it's going to have some miles. Um, as long as it runs and drives good, you know, yeah, it's... And that's and, the thing. And, I feel and like it, the car you know, it doesn't like today, drive it till, well, around here, April or May and sell it for $1,800 and, you know, I'll be out gas money, assuming there's nothing mechanically weird, which right. here's a tip. If you're selling a car on Craigslist or Facebook, add some like underhood shots. It, it's going to help you. Big but, tip. Yeah. Definitely, definitely a good tip. And you're right. 1800 bucks, as long as it doesn't blow an engine or a transmission, it's still going to be worth 1800 bucks in the spring when you go to sell it. Right. Yeah. So no, I, Hey, I I I would love to just you know rip you apart on that, but that's that's good winter beater material. Actually, it, I think that's an above average looking winter beater. Yeah, that would be something if it if it ran and drove good. Maybe you just hold on to for a second or a third car. You know, sure. So I gave you my first one. Oh dear, okay. was sure. Well, before before I get going on this, we we had two choices, right? We could pick two cars, right. and and I mean, obviously, we're we're picking things that we like. I thought I would take it a slightly different direction. I would make one pick of okay, here's a car that would just be a fun winter beater for me, and another car that I'll start with first here um, that would be a good winter beater for anybody. And I'll start this off by saying a good winter beater for anybody. It doesn't have to be all wheel drive. The key yeah. for getting around in winter is having good tires and enough ground clearance where you're not going to be scraping if you run into a couple inches of snow. So nothing super sporty or low. That said, pretty much anything front wheel drive, you know, with a little bit of weight on the drive wheels, invest in some good snow tires. You'll do much better with snow tires than you would with all wheel drive without. Yes, I know. All wheel drive will get you going through snow. Well, acceleration is 33% of driving. You still have to stop and turn. Yeah. So in theory, if I have snow tires on my Ford Mustang, which I do, I can stop and turn. That's 66%. Technically, am I better to get through snow? Yeah. Anyways, we're, 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 on another, we're on another podcast discussion. Right. Anything front wheel drive, put some good snow tires on it. Um, the choice that I found is actually a car that I've had before. 
This is a 2003 Infinity i35 that you can get for 1800 bucks. Now, so Infinity I am shocked by that you could get that car for that money. That the, the the i35s, I mean they just it, it's a Nissan Maxima. You know, it's 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 yeah. an early 2000s Nissan. It, I mean it literally is a Maxima. They they give it Infinity badges, they give it HIDs. They give it heated it's seats. Interior, it, right? Well, yeah, yeah. But it's, mechanically, it's a Maxima. Mechanically, it's a Maxima, which, I mean, in this case, that's the 3.5 liter V6 that I think is 260 good motor. Power. It was It was a good engine. Yeah. Um, I actually bought one of these a few years ago. It's been now for a winter beater. And yeah, I mean, I bought a set of, of winter tires and snow tires. Um, I made a trip from, I actually, I made a couple trips from South Dakota back to Michigan in it, 160,000 miles. Um, I don't know how common you can find these cars for under 2000. Um, this one is in Minnesota. That's a little bit further away than, uh, than your search area, Bruce, but. Um, let's, let's be realistic. So I mean, we yeah, we discussed this earlier for <laughs> you, for me, I live in, you know, a relatively more urban area to be, I'm just outside of Toledo, Ohio. So Ann Arbor is an hour and a bit away. Cleveland is two hours away. Columbus is two hours away. Like I've got a lot more around me than you do. I have, I have rapid city, which is about 75,000 people. And then I have nothing. Yeah. For hours um i mean real realistically denver is about six and a half hours away whoa that's a that's trip. that's that's the that's the biggest that, that's the biggest city by far anywhere near me so yes i i didn't cheat again i expanded my search area a little right. bit um i want to say i bought my infinity for like 2500 though okay um and it but i mean it had a lot of hail dings in it but i mean i got the hail dings removed this one, um, this got two hundred. It looks like I'm just curious. To yeah, see yeah, we, we've we've got that. interior pictures. I mean, okay, that's nice. You know, I mean, I mean, they're nice inside. I, like I said, it it's it's really just a dressed up Maxima, but this can give you something with a little bit of luxury. Sure. Um, it, I mean, it'll have heated steering wheel. It'll have heated seats. Uh, mine actually had like the old school navigation where you put in various CDs oh, to, uh, you know, to, to, to bring, up, to bring up the map. Seen. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the downside on this, this one is got 262,000 miles. That that'll be a hard, that'll be a hard sell uh, to anybody because it, I mean, it is getting up there, but sure. the car, the car looks pretty clean. Um, you know, it, it says it's been maintained well. Um, it does say it uses a half a quart of oil every 1200 miles. So that's kind of, but, that's a, but, but I mean, that, that's like a, a quart between changes. You know what? I mean, if, if the, the valve seven steels are a little, little weak or, or the piston rings are a little weak. I mean, it's not, it's a winter beater, right? right. So 1800 bucks, I go toss them 1400 bucks. They'll take it. Exactly. Yeah. 1500. And, you say, Oh, you're asking 18. Here's 15 cash. What, you know, they're not going to say no. You're going to drive it for three months. You know, you're going to get your fun out of it and you'll sell it. You know, even if you sell it for a grand, you lose 500 bucks that, you know, it is what and, it is. And anybody who lives where it's cold will appreciate heated seats and a heated steering wheel. Yeah. And yeah. with a set of snows on that thing, there is no place you won't be able to go unless you're trying to climb the side of some hill in, you know, two feet of, of wet snow. Or I mean, yeah, and, just think about a normal commute. Like you're going to, you know. Yep. It's a car you'll be able to drive to work, no problem. And if the Infinity thing doesn't do it for you, substitute this for any front wheel drive generic sedan yeah. from the last, you know, from 15 years ago. And that works for you, right? I think that's a good choice. The oil thing would give me pause, but, you know, it is what it is. But for 1800 bucks, again, yep. that you're not going to drive, it's not a car you're going to keep, you know, that's not right the here. Well, and, and I did do some maintenance on mine. I mean, I had to replace a motor mount and, um, I mean, I didn't think it was terribly difficult to work on. You look at this engine photo and you think, oh, my God, that's shoehorned in there. But that engine cover is just massive. You take that engine cover off and things are actually fairly accessible. Um, I, I enjoyed the hell out of the car, to be honest. Very cool. Well, I think that means it's my turn. It again. is, it you is your turn for number two. How you don't need all wheel drive. And you're right. You don't need all wheel drive. But what if you can get all wheel drive? What if that's available? 
So I found a 2006 Subaru Forester X, which I looked it up. That was the base model. Uh, it is $1,860, 230,000 miles, which admittedly is a lot. Like I can't, can't fight that. But I actually found one that was slightly cheaper than this with slightly more miles. But I liked this one because I felt like the seller was so honest. Um, if you, as you read, basically, um, the guy's done maintenance on it. It's got new catalytic converter, upgraded exhaust, spark plugs, wires. Um, he claims it's always been oil changed. You know, so it, it's been a car that's been loved. You can see in it that it's got a car seat in it. So clearly the guy was thought it was safe enough to take his kids in it. It's got the nice uh, rubber floor mats in the back and the cargo area. Like, you know, you're right that front wheel drive is all you need. But if you can get it for the money, you know, for 1860, which means like we were saying 1600, probably if you offered it to him, you would take it. That's a pretty nice car. Like, yeah. Does it, does it come with an extra set of head gaskets? <laughs> well, no, it doesn't, which could be an issue admittedly with this t- type of Subaru. Is that now I know, I know head gaskets were an issue on the earlier, uh, the, the legacies, um, the cars like from the late nineties into the early two thousands. I'm not as familiar with, with some of the later cars. I don't know if that was actually still really an issue in 2006. I it's right on the cusp. I believe mm-hmm. um, I do know they fix that eventually. And I can say that because my wife and I, we have a, a 2012 outback with the 2.5 and haven't had a bit of mm-hmm. issues with it. You know, we've had it since 2012. We bought it new. Um, so, you know, it, it's going to vary. I think this one's going to be right on the cusp, but if it's made it 230,000 miles, it can probably make it one more winter. And, you know, at least it, it has definitely from what the listing says, it's had some maintenance done. So the person behind it, it you know, it wasn't completely, you, you know, it wasn't run into the ground. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, I tell people a lot, you don't need all wheel drive for winter. It certainly helps, especially if you have um, if you have good tires. I stress tires over everything else, um, simply because accelerating is only, like I said earlier, it's only part of the equation. I could accelerate, I could accelerate just as good as an all-wheel drive car in something front-wheel drive with a good set of snow tires versus all-wheel drive with some sketchy all seasons. And I agree with that. I'll, I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that. That's a challenge to anybody out there. I'll take that to the bank. Come on but out to South Dakota. Price, you can race my Mustang. We could only spend two grand, and this got under two grand, and yep. it was kind of hard to pass up. Like, you know, no. it, it, I've owned I've owned two Subarus. You're not wrong. You're absolutely not wrong. And and really, even with with that kind of mileage, um, that's not uncommon for Subies to have higher no. miles. I don't I don't think as long as that's still running good, I don't think you would have trouble selling that in the uh, in the spring. Yeah. Okay, so I, we've been talking a lot about front and all-wheel drive, and I I know what your pick is <laughs> yes. someplace else. Yes, you but, do. But I agree with because my grandmother had I think basically this car, and she never had an issue with it in the snow. So go ahead. Well, there's a reason why police forces use this car for uh, and taxis and up, up, upwards of thirty years. Come on, everybody, you know what I'm talking about. It's got to be the Crown Victoria. Look at that. Look at that. 2011 Ford Crown Victoria Police Interceptor, 112,000 miles. Which is nothing for that car. (laughs) It's nothing for that car. Runs excellent. Now, it is $2,450. I would would bet that extra $450 that if I went to this person with $2,000 cash and I said, I'll take this right now, they would take it. If you had cash in hand, yeah. Absolutely. So if you were writing so, a check or something sketchy like that, no. But nope. if it was a we, cash in hand deal, I bet you could get it for two grand debt. Exactly. When you're going to do deals like this with winter beaters, cash talks. Don't yeah. I can't tell you how many people would come to me looking to buy some of the cars that I've bought after driving them through the winter. Well, would you take this? Well, would you take that? Well, did you have any cash on it? Well, no. It's like 
show me you're serious. You know, right. show show me you're serious. So show up with two thousand dollars cash. I bet you could get this. I mean, it's it's got a freaking photo album from every single angle. It does okay. It it, it does look a little rough here. That's uh. She's had a little love there on the back corner. <laughs> it's, it's it's a little beat up. I, let me tell you something. The crown vix like this, the, you know, the especially the end of the Panthers here. There's a serious following for these cars, um, you know, especially the police interceptors. There have always been followings for ex police cars, and it is tough to find cars like this cheap. Um, when I first started looking. I mean, I, I was seeing stuff, you know, 160, 180, 200,000 miles, still six, seven grand. They looked better than this. Um, but there's just such a following for these vehicles. It's tough to find them cheap. So I'll I'll concede it'll be a little tough to find, but it's worth the look. Um, and here's why. I've owned um, all kinds of cars. Actually, my first car was, a, was an older Crown Victoria. Um, I drove a 94 Buick Roadmaster sedan, which I, I mean, that's, that's, that's Buick, but it's still, it's a big front engine, rear drive, full size, classic body on frame sedan. I drove that through a Michigan winter and I didn't even have snow tires on it. I actually bought it. It had um, it, it, the previous owner had put like light truck tires on it. So it had these, <laughs> it had these, it had these white letters, like something you see on a silver auto, right? It had the you know white letter. They were like two thirty five sixties, fifteen. So they were fairly narrow. They were really tall, um, and I, I knew it would really go through the snow well, even being rear wheel drive. And it did. I mean, I literally drove it uh, about two and a half miles down an unplowed road um, to get to the job that I had at that point. This was during one of the bigger blizzards that had hit Michigan that year. Um, the road was unplowed. I would go anywhere from, you know, okay, I'd be on dry pavement where the wind had blown across the street to I've got to climb a hill and it looks like it's drifted about two feet deep. And this car went through it without any snow tires. I did have a little extra weight in the trunk just to be on the safe side. That's what but, I was going to say. Throw some but, sandbags in the back. And the yeah. other thing is, is that because of the long wheelbase, and this is something a lot of people don't think about, is that if say you're in a situation when you they do start to slide <laughs> a longer wheelbase makes it easier to catch it's you know, very it's not a sports car type thing it's it, it's kind of a much slower type yep yeah it's it's easier to catch and i'm, I'm I'll, I'll be blatantly honest here there's tremendous fun factor in that yeah i i love i love opposite lock as long as you're smart about it. I mean, the average person isn't going to get into this car and drive it through winter because the average person, I sadly, isn't that interested in the act of driving, of being of being really involved. They just want to get in and go to point A to point B. This is not the winter car for you. This is this is a winter car for somebody that still needs something that'll get them through the snow, get them through the hard times, but still has plenty of fun factor. You put a, a big V8 up front driving the wheels and back, especially with a good set of snow tires, you would be jaw dropped at the places you could go with that car that you would never, never imagine you could go. So I, I would even pay the extra 450 bucks. Go ahead. and uh, Yeah, I, I cheated. That's okay. This, and this, car, this car is worth it. The other thing I wanted to bring up is that because there are so many of these in police service and taxi service for so long, parts are nothing. Like right. if there's anything that needs to re be replaced, even though it's an older car, because there are so many in fleet still, you can still get parts for them at AutoZone or, you know, whatever. Parts are everywhere. Parts are plentiful. And as long as you don't completely tear it up, heck, even if you blow an engine, you can go get a, you can get a 4.6 engine at the junkyard. Sure. Pretty cheap. And it's it's you're not going to lose your, you're not going to lose your head on it because the Crown Vic there's a following, the ex police cars there's a following. I do it I do it every day and twice on Sundays. Yeah, I can't like uh, that specific you know rear wheel drive you know I wouldn't suggest an MR2 <laughs> for your winter beater but that specific Actually, one that big sedan oh you had an MR2 <laughs> I, I haven't had an MR2 but you know what with the, with the mid engine with extra weight on the back. I bet that would surprise you too. It probably wouldn't turn quite as good. I really want to try a Corvair in the winter. 
I mean, people had to have done them. I oh, I, oh I, I know. I know they did it. Yeah. And it, you see them every now and again. Rear engine Corvair. I mean, I mean, look at look at all the 911s that have done rally. Sure. Yeah. You know, yeah. As, as long as you have weight over the drive wheels and some good tires front and back. Yeah. Go for it. That, that's a fair point. Yeah. That was fun. That was a fun conversation. I really enjoyed that. <laughs> this, this is where this is where it gets dangerous because after the podcast, what are you doing? Probably the same thing that I'm doing. Well, let's let's jump back on Craigslist. Let's see what's yeah, here. No, exactly. Let's let's go to Detroit Craigslist. Maybe there's something cool there that I haven't seen. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> yeah, I've done that a few times. Well, let's yeah. look at Craigslist where I used to live. Exactly. Oh, I know where that car is. It's only like an eight-hour drive. Well, that's why I look at Akron Canton, because my parents live in that area, and I could always be like, so, Dad, there's this really cool Subaru XT6, and he only wants $1,200 for it. So if you could just, you know, that type yeah. of thing. Yeah, swing by. Exactly. Go ahead. Why not? But. We need well, to. We need to. Yeah, move we, on. we need to move on because we have something special um, that that Bruce is going to read here that that does kind of connect with Subarus. I know you were talking about Subarus for winter. Um, before we jump into that, if you're listening and you like what you hear, or if you don't like what you hear, you know, follow us, subscribe. We're on YouTube. We're on. Uh, we're on Spotify. We're on Apple Podcast. Like us. Subscribe. We're on um, YouTube, and please subscribe there. Our yes. boss slash friend Clint Simone would beat us up if we didn't tell you to subscribe there, because he keeps telling us tell people to subscribe there. So subscribe on YouTube. And and Clint, uh, I mean Clint handles a lot of the video productions that you see. Yeah. Um, you know, as far as new co- new car reviews, other content that we have on YouTube. We don't just have our podcast on our YouTube channel. We have all kinds of, of awesome car content, including some special drag races that we've done recently. So you'll you'll definitely want to check us out there. Yeah. So and you'll also want to email us at podcast at motorone.com for right now here. You've got some good winter beater ideas. We love to talk with our listeners. So Bruce, why don't you take it away here, man? Absolutely. So I'm going to ask you real quick, real quick, Smith. um, Do you have the image, the rendering that our reader pulled up still that you can share? I do. Let me uh, let me switch things around here because I unfortunately did not open it. I've got it right here. Okay. so we got one fan letter last week. Uh, or I'm sorry, we got one fan letter two weeks ago, and we also got one fan letter last week, and we're going to read that just like we did two weeks ago. So if you ever have ever wanted to hear your words read on a podcast, email us, because at this point, it seems like we'll probably read it. Um, and Nathan from Canada emailed us. Um, I'm not going to read his last name in case for any privacy reasons, but Nathan no from problem. Canada. And he said, hi, Bruce and Smith. I've been a listener and a fan of your podcast since the beginning. I was very happy to see you come back with new episodes in a new format. Now, here are my thoughts on what you said. I'm Canadian, so I totally agree with you about touch screens in the winter. Okay, I'm 16 and I've never driven in the winter, but I have been in a car in the winter, so I think I understand. Nathan will give it to you. Also, uh, a Chris, I don't remember which, we get confused all the time, uh, talked about the Genesis grill being too big on the G80. That so was me. It smaller. And he attached an image, which Smith has put up. And you can see he did make the grill slightly smaller. I mean, it's, it's, it's slightly smaller. Um, and and yeah, that, that was me because I'm not a big fan of the bigger grills. And, and Nathan, even just the minor tweak here, Bravo. I think yeah. this, I actually think this looks quite a bit better. Now looking at it just on its own, you may not necessarily know the difference. What we're going to do. If you jump over to motor one.com, we always post up on Fridays uh, when our podcasts go live, we put an article up at motor one.com just kind of talking about the podcast. We're going to put this rendering up there side by side with the actual G80 photo. So you can see the differences a little bit better. Yeah. It's shrunk down just a little bit, but it's amazing Right. To me, at it's least, just big difference. Uh, yeah, how, how much of a difference it makes? The uh, the grill has shrunk down a little bit. The uh, those dual plane headlights are stretched out just a little bit further. And uh, Genesis, I think this is I think this is the way to go. You don't just necessarily need to follow everybody difference. else with a big grill. You can shrink this down a little bit, and you're still going to have a sexy car. Okay, so I will continue further yes. on this point. Yes. 
it, absolutely. I, um, I think that winter driving gloves, the capacitive ones that work with touch screens, are a good idea, even though Mercedes would make them incredibly expensive. <laughs> they, have, they have normal leather gloves on their website that cost $300 Canadian. So, yeah, those are some, that's a, that's a pricey yeah. pair of gloves. Yeah, that's, that's par for the course. You also briefly talked about Mercedes voice control. And I asked myself, why don't they call their assistant Benz? It would make sense. First, you don't have to activate it when you talk with someone about your Mercedes. Nobody talks about their Mercedes with the full name calling it a Mercedes Benz. The other founder, Carl Benz, is not as often honored, so it'd be a great way to honor him. Plus, Apple doesn't call its assistant Apple, they call it Siri. So why would Mercedes call its assistant Mercedes? I think that's a decent point, actually. You know, it, it certainly makes some sense. Um, Mercedes, I always thought was kind of a clunky thing to say. I mean, a lot of people will say Benz. A lot of people will say Merck. Um, a lot of people say AMG. So whether, here, whether, whether or not they have an actual AMG, you know what I'm saying? So uh, just basing out what he said, why not name it Carl? Like, Carl. first off, there aren't that many Carls floating around out there. And it would be cool since a lot of these other voice things are, often have feminine voices to go with them. You think of Siri and um, uh, Alexa, things like that. What if Mercedes went masculine and you said, hey, Carl, wh yeah. where is this? It, it would be a neat Easter egg. But I mean, being Mercedes in German, I would be afraid if I said, hey, Carl, I would get something back like, yes, what do you want? <laughs> That's a possibility. <laughs> Carl, do not bother me. You know? <laughs> and uh, as I get my composure here, Nathan ended with a question. I have a question for you. Do you think a new Subaru sla uh, Baja slash Brat would sell better now than when they debuted? Subaru is rumored to be bringing them back, but I think it would be a. But I think um, it would be a small pickup truck rather than a car based truck like the Baja and Brat. Um, please continue making podcasts. Have a nice day, Nathan. Um, and so, Nathan, I thought about this. And my thing is, so the Brat came out when Subaru was still a fairly young company in the United States. Um, you know, the first Brats, I believe, are either late 70s or very early 80s. And that's not too long after Subaru arrived. And you have to remember, at that point in time, there, there was no internet there, you know, the infrastructure wasn't there. It was all kind of word of mouth or advertising in magazines, stuff like that. So I think the Brat wasn't such a success then, not so much because it wasn't an appealing vehicle, but because not that many people knew about it. The Baja though, you would think would have been a success because at that point in time, you know, the WRX was out. It was kind of a really good time for Subaru and yet it wasn't that much of a success. So I thought about that. And like I said earlier, my wife and I have a 2012 Outback and I've never needed the extra height to put in the back of it. So I wonder if, you know, there's just not that market there for someone wanting to put stuff in the back of a Baja or in the back of an Outback, I'm sorry. And also, you know, the legacy and the Outback are made at Subaru's factory in Indiana, at least the ones for United States consumption. And they sell a lot of both of those products. So I wonder if there's even the capacity, whether that they would want to take away that production of Outbacks in order to make whatever the next Baja was. However, I, and I kept thinking about this, Nathan, Try, that. there was a lot on my mind, man. Um, I am surprised there hasn't been any aftermarket firms building the converting them into pickup trucks because it would be fairly easy you know all of the structure is there you would basically just you know cut off the point from the second row passenger and convert it into a bed and i wonder if there'd be enough of a niche market for that type of thing that would actually make it you know a, a nice little cottage industry so smith you and i haven't talked about this what do you think well we actually, we, if I remember, we did kind of just barely brush on it last week when we were talking about Utes. Okay. And, yeah. and I mean, the, the Baja, I, I mean, Ute, okay, car based, two doors, just a bench seat up front, big bed in the back. Baja wasn't really that. But as we're looking now with vehicles like the upcoming Ford Maverick 
and the uh, the Hyundai, the Santa Cruz. Yes. Um, are people's is our taste changing? Maybe maybe the Baja was a little bit ahead of its time in that respect, because it, because at that point, I mean, trucks and SUVs were popular. They're now they're just I mean they're just insanely popular, right. and and people are going into ridiculous debt to buy these sixty and seventy thousand dollar pickup trucks, and I think I think yeah there there could be an interesting niche right now for the return of a Baja, something where you have, you know, we'll, we'll stick with four doors, right? We'll have the front seats. We'll have the rear seats. Cause, cause trucks that way are, are four doors now, you know, front seats, rear seats, something for the whole family. Very stick, few regular apps are still available. Very few. So stick with that formula, have a bed in the back. The, the thing when it comes to the, the beds like that, I, I, I hear what you're saying, Bruce. Um, people will start to realize the extra capability that they have once they have it. If, if you, if you follow what I mean, um, yeah, I, I mean, I mean, when I, when I briefly bought a pickup truck here a, a few years ago um, and, and just, I just, I just couldn't warm up to it. Um, it. I mean, it didn't take me long at all to realize, Oh, Hey, I can just toss the lawnmower in the back and go over, um, you know, help cut the grass out at the air and space museum or, uh, or, fill the bed up with, with a bunch of tree limbs and junk and not have to worry about trying to break it down to fit it into the back of the mouse. It's, it's a case of once you have that capability, you'll realize, Oh, okay. There, there's a lot that I can do here. It's pretty convenient. I think now people are more used to the idea of having that capability, but not necessarily needing a, a huge four wheel drive, very expensive pickup truck to, uh, to utilize that. And I think, I think automakers are starting to feel that way too, since we have the Ford Maverick, which is going to be a small four door vehicle. Um, I mean, it's not necessarily car based, but we're still talking about a unibody vehicle with a bed on the back, right? So, Subaru, I think now would be a good time to do it. Okay. I, I, I think my only thing is, I just wonder if the niche is big enough to justify the production, but also. The Baja was cool, especially that you could get it with the turbo engine, which basically makes it a WRX pickup truck. If you uh-huh, really kind of, yeah, yeah. So here's another thing to consider: um, when the Baja was around, you know, back in the in the was it early to mid two thousands? I think is all is all it had. I want to say it's the first year, something like that. At that point, if buyers wanted a small truck, basically, they could get one. They could go get a Ford Ranger. They could get. Um, when I'm trying to remember when the S10 switched over to the Colorado, well, it was somewhere around yeah. there. Um, and and you could even still get a, the Dodge Dakota, which was yeah. technically a midsize truck, but you could still get a, it was still a fairly small midsize truck. There were options for people at that point. Those options are really gone now. You can still get a Colorado; it's bigger than it was. There is there is no Dakota, right? Yeah. There there is no. There is no small ranger. The ranger is back. Modern much ranger bigger than it was. Bigger than the ranger. Right. So, uh, I mean, it, I guess you can go to Nissan or Toyota and still get a fairly small truck, but the yeah. the market the market's much smaller now. So, yeah, I think I, I, I think there's room to bring it back. Yeah. Very. It, so, we're talking about you know, Utes and what car based pickups. Uh, that leads kind of pretty well into what we wanted our second segment to be, which is about how we define vehicles. And I, what I mean by that is like vehicle segments. What is – we when I say a sedan, what do you think of? When I say a coupe, what do you think of? And this is something that Smith has talked about in our chat many, many times, and we thought that this was a really good opportunity to delve into that. I have so, a feeling this is going to be like just the first – episode of a continual discussion that will come up again and again and again, because I feel like this is going to be a rabbit hole. So many people have different interpretations of the terminology, sedan, coupe, wagon, estate, shooting break. Um, And there's in, in some cases, there's, 
you know, clear lineage to where, okay, where these terms came from, but the terms are also evolving. I mean, obviously we've seen manufacturers evolving the, uh, the coop term and using it rather liberally in, in some applications, but are they really, is it really that liberal? Once you look at some of the past, co you know, ideas, conceptions of what these terms actually signify, maybe, you know, maybe it's not so much. Yeah, I'm on. I'm with you. Like I, what I find most interesting is kind of the linguistics of cars, or at least in this conversation, the, linguist, the linguistics of cars, where there has been a lot of hate for a long time for the term uh, crossover coupe or coupe crossover, depending on how you want to mix that. And then one of our former Motor One editor and our good friend Steve Ewing was talking about recently how he's learning to accept the crossover coupe. He still doesn't like the coupe term, but that niche, he, he he's starting to accept it. So it's well, just interesting how over time our opinions and our thoughts about what these terms mean change. Well, so, let, let me ask you, Bruce, what, I mean, what is your definition of a coupe? I mean, I got to go with the classic one. It's that it's two doors that, you know, Two doors equal coupe. But is um, that is that really the classic definition? I mean, I guess technically, technically, yes. Um, coupes have, have often been considered, okay, it's something with two doors. Really, though, the defining aspect of the coupe traditionally hasn't been two doors, but rather it's sloping roof line. That's sure. that's that's been the 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 primary identifier for coupe being the sloping roof line versus the the flatter the more boxy roof line of the sedan but yes along with that generally considered two or three doors um i mean there are some instances where you know, you know, it would Below basically, be, yeah basically be be sort of like a like a goofy hatchback um that some people can can call a coupe over time um Another kind of classic definition of the coupe is, okay, it's it's either going to have just two seats or it, it's going to have a smaller back seat with smaller leg room than what you would find in a larger vehicle. That almost bleeds into an other, like that. It, it, it does. It does. Because you think, okay, a, a, a two-seater coupe, how many two-seater coupes are there? Just about every two-seater you see out there is a convertible, right? Sure. I mean, I so mean, nine eleven to to some of them like towards the eighties that changed like nine forty four you could get or I'm sorry RX seven you could get purely as a two seater three hundred ZX yeah. you could get purely as a two seater and but you the, and you and you think of those as coupes right oh totally yeah so so I mean there's there's kind of your your generally accepted pseudo classical definition of a coupe but what what stands out over time and especially in the olden days back when color back before color was invented and and cars ran on rainbows um the the defining characteristic of a coupe was that sloping kind of swept back roof line um yeah. and another thing that often defined a coupe was no fixed b pillar that's that's not now we're starting to talk more about coupe versus sedan. Let me uh let me bring up a picture here of a really kind of a classic idea of a coupe. Um if you look back like the like the late 60s chargers, I mean this that's what we're looking at right here, a charger. Um I mean it's 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 got it's got the two doors, but more importantly, it has that swept roof line, that that very sweeping roof line, no fixed B pillars. That's a, that's kind of more of a classic thing. No fixed B pillars. There is a back seat in there, but when you look inside, the back seat is sitting much closer to the back of the front seats. There isn't as much legroom back there as you would find, say, in a typical sedan. And and I think when people talk about modern, you know, four door coupes or the coupe crossovers, they see four doors and they they think that can't be a coupe. The doors, honestly, folks, that's only one part of the coupe definition um and admittedly when automakers first started talking about their four-door coupes i was i was with that train of saying okay this is ridiculous they're just they're trying to make their sedan sound sexier 
So what's the first one you can think of? CLS is the first one that comes to mind for me. Mercedes Benz CLS. Is- I, I mean, I mean, I think that's I think that's probably the first where it just had that just really gorgeous swept roof line, but it right. had four doors. And well, and, and I guess technically, I think maybe the Mazda RX eight opened up the, the oh. question a little bit because it had that little it had that it had you know, the, the little back door. doors. Yeah, the little back doors that would open. Let's see if I can find a picture of that while we're talking about that real quick. So but, yeah, go go ahead and, and look up the picture. I know we're gonna have all kinds of opinions on this podcast at motorone.com. Email us your opinion. Honestly, I would love to debate this. I, I could debate this for hours, not not to try to prove a point, but just to understand better the the larger picture, the more general consensus. Because since automakers have started talking about coupe crossovers, um, four door coupes. I've kind of I've kind of grown into it. You know, I get it a little bit more now. They're talking about that big sweeping roof line that is very much a coupe characteristic. And maybe doors don't have to play as big a role there. Now, of course, they all still have B pillars. That's that's another question altogether. So there's your RX8 with its doors open. And yeah, that's interesting. Is that a coupe? Is that a I mean, not- that's it's, it's got four doors. Yeah. But are you going to call that a sedan? There's no there's no fixed B pillar either. That's true. Yeah. So, I mean, my mind I would call that a coupe. It's an I, I would call that a coupe. Prove me wrong. And then did you also have any greater opinions about what it means to be a sedan then? Because- you know, s- sedans um are are a little more interesting. Um the 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 classic definition of a sedan is something with a fixed B pillar. It doesn't have to have four doors over, over time. People have just assumed, okay, well, the coupe has two doors. A sedan has four sedans. There's never been a part of the official sedan definition that says it has to have four doors. Um, that fixed B pillar in the middle of the car is, is a defining characteristic of the sedan. Um, the rear leg room having, there's a specific number. I want to say something like 30 or 40 cubic feet of space. It, it gets really specific, but the, the the general point is it has that fixed B pillar with a flatter roof. It has larger space in the back. It does not have to have four doors. You can have a two door sedan and there've been two door sedans um, quite often throughout history. I've got a picture of one right now that's, Kind of, kind of goes along with what we were talking about earlier, Bruce. That is a Ford Crown Victoria two door sedan. Now that's uh, that's that's not the uh, the latest generation. That's that's look. That's what probably in eighty four. That, that's the boxy eighties Crown Vic. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people don't realize they made those in a two door. That's not a coupe though. That's got a fixed B pillar in there. It still has the big back seat and it's, it, it looks kind of weird. I mean, look, look how long, look, look how much space there is from the back of the door going all the way back to that trunk lid. I mean, it's, it's still a big car, but it's a two door sedan. Um, a lot of people call like the, the eighties Mustang notchbacks call those two door sedans. Right. So I got to fight you here. I got a 62 Lincoln Continental up. It's clearly got four doors. There's no fixed B pillar. What is it? It's a convertible. That one is. I can find you a pick. Fine. You want a hard top? I'll give you a hard top. But what is it? Is that? I, I would I would classify that as a sedan because I've, I've seen those with the hard tops up. It doesn't have the sloping roof of a that you would associate with a coupe. And it's still going to have a very large rear seat area, even though it doesn't have the fixed B pillar. Oh, damn it. You know what? It does have a fixed B pillar. It's just hidden on the uh, sedans here. Oh, it does? Okay. I've never, okay, busted. Woo. No, no I've, I've never actually looked that close at the Lincoln, at those older Continental uh, hardtops. I've only, only ever There's seen them. The in sedan, and you can see... Yep. The B pillar running. All right. Damn it. You got me. Yep. Yep. There's the B pillar and it's got that flat roof. So when you're talking about sedan versus coupe, 
if if you want to boil it down to some very basic factors, sedan generally the fixed B pillar, the flat roof, larger space in the back, doors don't matter. Coupe, you're going to have the sloping roof line. That's the defining characteristic. Doors generally two doors, but as we've seen in modern times, that's that definition is is shifting, and and I'm okay with that. And it's going to have smaller space in the back. But therein lies another another question, another quandary. Mm-hmm. We're talking about four door coupe crossovers mm-hmm. that you would think, okay, they're they're going to have a fair amount of space in the back seat, right? So now that's two of the, that's no. two of the three definitions. That's two of the three defining factors for a coupe that these cars don't have. So now I'm now I'm doubting myself. Now I'm questioning myself on this. Okay, are these really coupe crossovers? You know, what do you Folks, think? Yeah. Podcast. <laughs> we need help. Here's what you need to we do. We need help. We need more alcohol. What is a coupe? What is a sedan? It gets complicated. It it really does. I mean, and, we're we're talking about some basic definitions here, but we've we've seen just in this discussion how how can get blurred so easily. And speaking of that, so obviously Smith and I we discussed these podcast topics beforehand, and well, this is completely with- unscripted. We are so much better than Top Gear. And he came up with the idea of talking about, you know, these different vehicle segments. And I kind of came at it with a very kind of 90 degrees different from that in that I wanted to look at it from a linguistic point of view. And what got me curious is what is a muscle car? And I don't mean what is a muscle car? Like, what is it? When was the term muscle car created? And why was it created and things like that? So, do you have an opinion on what the first muscle car was? Like, there's kind of a lot of points. It's, it's, you know, I've never looked at it in depth, but I remember some time ago being, you know, mildly interested in the origins of the term. And I, I want to say it goes back to like the late 50s or the early 60s Chrysler's, you know, when, when you started to see the birth of the Hemi head. Um, but I don't have any specific dates. I don't have any specific cars. It's like a, uh, I'd have to look it up. Some, somebody, I know, I know somebody out there is listening saying, Oh, you stupid idiot. It's, it's the, it's the Chrysler 300 or, or something like and that. That's a valid answer. I've heard uh, the 49 Oldsmobile with the rocket 88 is a valid ant. Like defining start, what, you know, what's that? I'm sorry. I said, I said, where does it start? It's, it's so subjective. But what I wanted to figure out is when was the first use of muscle car? And I got to be honest with you, I didn't find the answer, but I found some really interesting stuff along the way, or at least I found it interesting. And I think if you're a fan of automotive history and if you're a fan of kind of linguistics, you might find it interesting. And so it's a thread on the AACA was kind of my primary thing here. And they are the Antique Automobile Club of America. And I... If you like old cars, especially old American cars, I recommend checking them out. They have a really good YouTube page where sometimes they drive stuff. They have a fantastic library, a really, really fantastic library of old car materials. And they'll sometimes go through that on their YouTube page. These guys are A+. But anyway, so there was a thread on there, and it was started January 22nd, funnily enough, almost on the anniversary, 2011. So this is nearly a 10-year-old discussion, Um, and it was exactly what I was searching for. Muscle car, where did this term originate? And the funny thing is, even through multiple pages, through multiple years, no one has an exact answer. (laughs) But there's some really interesting, like, where it could have come from. So I am going to start with the earliest that they posted, um, you know, there, it's got to be earlier than this. It is a 19, I'm, let me get the year right. I believe it is a 65. Da, da, da. Yes, this is from the November 1965 issue of Car and Driver magazine. And this was the earliest muscle car 
in print reference that they had. And you know what? I'm sorry. Let me kind of flying by the seat of my pants here. I'm hoping this is the right one. Woohoo! Got it right. So Chevelle SS 396. New Chevelle SS 396 by Chevrolet. But I want to address you, or I want you to look at the bottom left if you're watching on YouTube. And if not, I'm about to read it to you. If you're tired of hearing a lot about claims for the so-called muscle cars, and I say that because it is in quotes, get yourself a Chevelle. One with measurements and a set of reflexes too, an SS 396. And then right below that, you see the November 1965 thing. No, um, this is this is an ad, right? This, this, this is an ad. Yes. This, oh, is okay, a, yeah, this is an ad in, in Car and Driver. Yes. In the November issue. And so here's what's interesting about that. The fact that it's in quotes means that the term must have preexisted that even if the folks on this forum can't come up with an earlier thing because putting it in quotes says that, mm -hmm. but it's also interesting. So 65, that's still fairly early. And an SS 396 is something we would still identify as a muscle car today. It was Chevy's, you know, the Chevelle was the mid, excuse me, the midline car. They put the big engine in it and there you go. So I'm going to take I, I want to. I want to say, and I. I have no evidence to back this up. Please. But I. I, I want to say, like sixty two or sixty three is is when it first started to, to be be mumbled, and I and I think it goes back to uh to Chrysler, but you know, but again, I I I you know what I'm gonna look that up. I'm, I'm, so now, now, now you gotta be interested again. Damn it, Bruce! I didn't have enough to do. So again, here is, let me make sure I got the right one up. Yeah. Um, here is the earliest headline. So this is a story rather than an ad. Did I pick right? I should, oh, darn, I didn't. Ignore that. It'll be back in a second. Okay, we're, we're ignoring it. We are ignoring it. And, and what's also interesting too is... Um, I mean, the term muscle car itself is debatable because sure. it's it's applied to cars. If, if if you go up to the wrong person and you say, hey, I like your Mustang. It's my favorite muscle car. You could get punched in the nose. Exactly. Because they'll say it's not a muscle car. It's a pony car, you know, and oh, it, there's there's so much subjectivity to these terms. That that's why I say this could be the first of many, many follow up episodes. And frankly, I welcome it. I, I love hearing all of these different opinions, all of these different attacks. Hell, I've, I've almost talked myself out of accepting modern coupe crossovers now <laughs> because because they're only meeting one of the three classic coupe criteria. So the image that I'm sharing right now is apparently from the September 66 issue of popular science. And I will read the headline for those not watching. Merck makes the muscle car scene. Muscle cars all together. It is not two separate words. So it tells you how things evolve over time uh, with a striped and scooped Comet Cyclone GT that doubles in durability. And we should and we should clarify in this instance, Merck refers to Mercury, oh, not, 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 not Mercedes-Benz. Sorry, folks. Yes, There's, in, in, the, in the U.S., we love our Mercs, um, but but I, in this case, it's Mercury. Yes, this is a Mercury Comet Cyclone GT. I, you know what? I almost missed that too. Good, yeah. So well, Mercury's yeah. been gone for how long? It's it's. I mean, it's sad. It's for out of our decade, fifteen years. It's got maybe longer than that. Yeah, but yeah. So this is a car. So it says. Uh, here in the caption, bold frontal styling and stack quads, referring to the headlights, give the sleek cyclone that big car look. Fiber class, uh, fiber class hood on test car was poorly fitted. Great <laughs> job, Mercury, for sending the badly fitted test car to journalists. Potent 335 horsepower mill, boasts big Holly quad cor carburetors, reworked sparker, and 5,000 RPM cam. Auto trans engine is shown here. So, but yeah, it's just interesting. So this is 66. 66, so, and that's clear muscle car scene. Yeah. Um, 
And so those were the two really interesting images, but they also had an image from earlier in 65. This one is going to be from the July 1965 issue of Rod and Custom magazine. And I am sharing that now for our YouTube viewers. And there you go. And so what's interesting here is the title of the story is Comparing the Hot Compacts. And the subhead is what's really cool. Whether you call them GTOs or super compacts, here is how the favorite five stack up. And so GTO at this point in time was the generic term for a muscle car or super compact, as they say. It, so it's just interesting that, you know, there is an alternate timeline where we called muscle cars GTOs. <laughs> I, I kind of like that idea. So it's a but fascinating this, road. It's something I want to keep researching, but I found this thread and I will link to it uh, in our post so you guys can see everything and all the discussion. But it's just fascinating. The way we talk about cars evolves over time. We are such nerds on this and I, I feel like we're not alone. Um, I hope ter people take terminology so seriously. Um, I mean, there's, there's more, there's so much more that we could talk about. We're, we're getting a little long on this podcast. I think we'll have to save some more for later, but yes, the history of the muscle car term, if you know more than we do, and it's quite likely that you do email us podcast at motor one.com. Tell us about some of your experience with these terms, what you think some of these terms mean, what a coupe means to you, what a sedan means to you, what, what a, a crossover, what a muscle car means to you, what a wagon means to you, a shooting brake. We, we didn't even talk about shooting brakes today. We're going to do that. We'll, we'll have to. Yeah, we're going to do another episode. Yeah, we're going to do another episode. Shooting brakes, wagons, estates. Let us know what all is going on. Follow us on YouTube, like and subscribe. You can watch us there. Of course, motorone.com. We post articles up summarizing our podcast every Friday. The podcasts go up every Friday. You can You'll find all Spotify. the links. You'll find the YouTube video embedded there. You'll find the audio embedded there. You'll find the links to Apple iTunes and Spotify there. So that that's most of what we know people listen to. Again, as I said last week, if you listen to something else and you think it's we're not there and you want us to be there podcast at motor one.com. Let us know and we'll get there. Sounds good. Bruce, take us out. It's episode three. It is. So we started a game last week and we're going to try to play it quickly this time about, we want to see how many cars we can name based on the episode number we're on. So episode three cars with three Smith or, you know, I'll go first cars go with three BMW three series. That, that's that's obvious. Um, yeah. I've got a Mazda in the garage, so I've got to go Mazda three. That that's an easy one. Uh, I will go also a Mazda Mazda RX three. Ooh, okay, here, very here's good. A picture of it. Throwing some flames that's, down. That's, see, you got oh look at that. Oh, that looks fantastic. Yeah, Mazda see, RX. You, you've got pictures up here. I I I was slacking off. I was spending too much time looking up Crown Victorias. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I can I skate by with a three two three or is that considered no, three twenty three? That, that's already three series. The, 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 no, the the Mazda three two three. Oh, 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 oh. I... nobody calls it three twenty three. Come no, on, I'll give it to you. I'll give it to it, you. It's, it's the three two three. Okay, okay, okay. So speaking of Mazdas, one I'm kind of surprised you didn't get Mazda MX three. MX three. I almost bought one of those as a winter beater once. That would be a good winter beater. Yeah. It it smoked more than like a casino from 1978 <laughs> in Las Vegas. I, I had to walk away from it. Yeah, understandably. But but it was pretty cool. So three, I'll okay. Well, we've got to go with the Tesla Model Three. That's what I thought of, and I forgot to grab a picture of Tesla. Ah, okay. Man, boys, rake me over the coals. That's fine. Th this is starting to get kind of tough. I've got a couple more. Okay. I've got, see, I've got actually three more and they're all BMWs. Let's see okay. how many you can do. Can you name one of them? The X3. I, that's one of them. Yeah. That's one of them. X3. The I3. The I3. I3. Yep. The M3. 
I, or do you, I or do you consider that three series? But yeah. Okay. Okay. What the X three, the I three. What else? Yeah. We got? But I'm, I'm drove just, it. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to start tossing out letters. A three. Well, there's the there's the Audi oh, A three. There we go. That's a good one. <laughs> okay. Come on. Okay. This is up to Last you. I, I got three in a row. Yeah. Exactly. Last one. Z three. All the. Oh my God! How can I forget the Z three? Yeah, C three. I I drove that car as a very very young kid when it first came out. When when Gold and I, I, I was actually working at a BMW dealership, and that car was just I mean it was the thing, right? And then I drove it. And I'm like, this is kind of slow. With, with the one point nine, they were a dog. <laughs> they were dog, but I mean it was it was a little convertible. You know, when you're a kid, yeah, I'll drive around with that. Very okay. cool. Well, I thank everyone for listening again, again, podcast at motor one.com, you know, with Nathan this week. And I apologize. I forget the reader last week who sent in, if you send us something, we'll probably we're, read it. We're, we're so, probably going to read it um, unless it's, unless it's like the, uh, the email that I got from the guy that I'm 99% sure was just a troll. Um, yeah, yeah. We're, 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 we're not going to read that stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. Yes. But, but communicate with us, man. We, uh, Hey, you might even be on the podcast at some point because yeah. we're car guys. We love talking about cars. Oh yeah. Once we get our life under us, you know, we're only on episode three. We're still kind of getting used to this podcast thing. We've both been on podcasts before, but hosting a little bit new, but once we get things under us, we're planning on doing interviews. We're planning on inviting people on like that's going to be part of this. So yeah, get in touch. Come be part of it. So yeah. Uh, Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, and thanks for listening, and bye-bye. See ya.